أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask him to send his peace and blessings upon all of his messengers and in particular Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The present topic, doing dawah whilst facing propaganda. What is propaganda? According to one of many definitions, it is the deliberate attempt by some individual or group to form control or alter the attitudes of other groups by the use of instruments of communication with the intention that in any given situation the reaction of those so influenced will be the desire will be that desired by the propagandists of course propaganda against Islam is nothing new the Quraysh used propaganda in the early stages of Islam but failed to destroy the mission of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam the early converts were all, all able to avoid falling into the Croatia distortions. During the Crusades, the West European powers, especially the Church, were very successful in creating anti-Islamic propaganda in order to create a climate where the people loathed and feared Muslims and were desperate to go out and rid the world of this religion. Studies of publication at the time portray Muslims as deprived savages worshipping the devil represented by an idol in Mecca. In recent times, Christian missionaries and Orientalists have been at the forefront in the propaganda war against Islam. They have produced numerous books, articles and leaflets attacking every tenant of the faith. According to the Minaret Journal, which is published in California, in the first two years after 9-11, more than 50 books were written just attacking the Quran. In a time when everyone has become an expert and authority in Islam, some missionaries and orientalists have made very radical and astound, astounding claims about Islam and the Muslims. Some have claimed that Mecca never existed before the 6th century. Others have described Muslims as worshippers of a pagan moon god. And others have even questioned the very existence of the Quran before the 9th century. As an author writes, People will believe a big lie sooner than a little one. And if you repeat it frequently enough, people will sooner or later believe it. Of course, propaganda can take many forms. Some can be very blatant, while others can be as subtle as a joke. At times, its persuasive techniques can have immediate effect. Or at other times, it may take several generations to fulfill one's desired goals. Those who work within the framework of Dawa need to understand how propaganda can be used against Islam. It is in the interest of some to misrepresent Islam and the Muslims. We are all aware of a variety of slanders against Islam. These slanders are much more powerful when backed by a propaganda machine which takes them to a wider audience. The global image of Islam in general has suffered significantly from negative propaganda. We should therefore have an interest in finding out how we can deal with propaganda in a smart and productive way and continue doing dawah effectively. And who better to address this topic than the following speaker, Sheikh Shabir Ali, who for the last 20 years has devoted his life to refuting the distortions and false allegations of missionaries and Orientalists. Sheikh Shabir Ali was born in Georgetown, Guyana and moved to Canada in 1978. He's the president of the Islamic Information and Dawa Center International based in Toronto. He appears weekly on the TV program, Let the Quran Speak, which is being viewed throughout Canada. He has authored several booklets, which include common questions people ask about Islam. Is Jesus God? The Bible says no. 101 contradictions in the Bible. The plight of women in the Old Testament and Quran and signs, to name just a few. Sheikh Shabir Ali also holds a BA degree in religious studies from Laurentian University in Ontario and is presently doing his master's degree. He has represented Islam in numerous debates and dialogues with leading Christian, Jewish and atheist scholars. He also gives public lectures on a variety of topics. 
With that, I would ask Sheikh Shabir Ali to commence his talk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasul al Karim. Wa kul jaha al haqq wa zaka al batil. Inna al batil akana zahuqa. Uh, the truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has come and the falsehood dissipates. In fact, the falsehood is always dissipating. Now, Muslims have the responsibility to defend the religion of Islam and also to promote that message to other people. I want to talk about some of the propaganda we face and how to take a proactive uh, measure in uh, countering some of this uh, negative propaganda. Now, of course, uh, we are aware of all kinds of propaganda against Islam. We know that every means, every medium, is being used uh, to slander Islam, to belittle Muhammad sallallahu and to make Muslims in general look bad. So how do we counter all of that? Uh, I, I believe that the best way is for each individual Muslim uh, to be properly educated about Islam and uh, uh, for each one to be able to defend uh, Islam wherever you are. So whether you're at work, whether you're just riding on, on the public transit, and you meet people you are in conversation, you should be capable, every one of you, of defending what, uh, what you believe in. Now this is very easy for the Muslim because in fact your faith is a very rational faith. So if you think about what makes sense, uh, you will see that most often that in fact is Islam. And uh, without uh, in fact having studied much yourself, you will find that you are better at defending what you believe uh, against uh, ev everyone else uh, than they can stand up for their own positions. Now, most of the people that you will meet uh, have this kind of atheist bent. And we spoke earlier about what is being taught in school. And we said that many atheists will say that most people just believe in God because uh, of fear. People feared things, and because of that, they invented the idea of God. I want to talk first about how to counter atheistic sorts of arguments very quickly. Now, here is one of them. Now, in logic, we speak about what is called the genetic fallacy the genetic fallacy in argument. You should not recognize this fallacy wherever it occurs. That's a fallacy where somebody argues that because something came from the wrong place or came up for the wrong reason, the thing itself is wrong. Now that uh, is a fallacy because even if somebody believed the wrong thing, or even if somebody believed something for the wrong reason, it doesn't mean the thing itself is wrong. Uh, if, uh, for example, a certain person believes uh, that a little bird told him to buy a certain lottery ticket, and he bought that lottery ticket, it is quite possible that that might be the winning lottery ticket, even though he believed it for the wrong reason. The fact that he believed it for the wrong reason doesn't stop that lottery ticket from winning. Of course, we should say to the person, you shouldn't believe things for wrong reasons, uh, but that doesn't mean that the thing itself is wrong. Now, if people invented the idea of God for the wrong reason, that doesn't by itself prove that God does not exist. Because God might still exist and people didn't know him and because of fear or whatever reason, they came up with the idea of God. So the fact that they came up with the idea of God, if some people did, for the wrong reason, that by itself doesn't prove that God does not exist. Now on the other hand, there are very good reasons for thinking that God does exist. Uh, first, uh, we know that from nothing, nothing comes. The universe does exist. We do have something here and it must have a reason for its existence and God is the reason for the existence of the universe. That is the best explanation and that is our first argument. Uh, in counter to this, somebody may say, but then who created God? Now we should help them to understand what we mean by God because when we speak of God, we mean the first cause, the uncreated creator of everything else. So since he's the uncreated creator of everything else, there's no sense of asking who created the uncreated creator. The sentence itself is nonsensical and does not deserve an answer. Once we realize that God is the first cause, then you cannot ask, well, who came before the first cause? What is the cause of the first cause? Because if there was the, a cause of the first cause, that indeed would be the first cause, and that is what we mean by God. So our first uh, argument is that nothing comes from nothing. We do have something, and that the best explanation for this something is that God exists and created this universe. Second, the universe is designed. And as much as people try to deny the presence of, uh, of design in the universe, we see that right from the very inception of the universe, scientists think that the four fundamental constants were precisely fine-tuned to be what they, what they are. Otherwise, the universe itself would not exist. 
That shows that the universe is finely tuned and there has to be someone to do the fine tuning. That is the creator of the heavens and the earth. A third argument is that we have morality. And everyone will say that cer certain things are right and certain things are wrong. Now there are two reasons or two explanations for this sense that people have. One explanation is that we just simply develop this sense through our cultural and biological evolution over time. That's one explanation. And the other explanation is that God created us with that sense. Now what about the first explanation? As Thomas Morris wrote in his book Philosophy for Dummies, that first explanation does not really work because if people had the sense that they should do things which will enable their sort of survival, that would be better credited to the idea of biological and cultural evolution over time. But that's not the sense that people have. People are not thinking, let's do what will cause us to survive. Hitler thought he was doing that. He wanted to create a superior race. If all of us thought like Hitler, we should say, yes, uh, that's uh, understandable. That's our cultural and biological evolution. We are trying to further the evolution of a better and more superior race. But all of us balk at that idea. We think that Hitler was a kind of uh, a, um, a, 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 he's a deviation from the norm. And the norm is that people think that certain things are right and certain things are wrong no matter what. So it's wrong to steal even if it will benefit you. It's wrong to murder and rape and torture even if it will benefit you. So where do we get the sense that some things are right and some things are wrong even if it will not aid your own survival? The better explanation is that God exists and gave us this moral sense. So our first argument was that something does exist and that needs an explanation. The best explanation for that is God. The second argument was that everything has the appearance of design and the best explanation for that design is again God. The third argument is that we are moral beings. We have a sense that differentiates between right and wrong and the best explanation for that is God exists who gave us that sense. Four, the history of the world knows uh, a, a number of persons throughout history who have sincerely uh, pledged their belief in God and they believe that God spoke to them and gave them a message to speak to others. And we know that uh, many of these individuals, their lives have been documented, they're in the Old Testament, many prophets, and uh, they are obviously very sincere individuals, like the prophet Jeremiah, like the prophet Isaiah, like the prophet Musa alayhi salam. The best we know of him is that when he was going back to preach to the Pharaoh, he was actually going to face his death because Pharaoh wanted to kill him. But he nevertheless was willing to go and face that, th that circumstance. Similarly, in the case of the prophet Jeremiah, he was preaching things that uh, he himself at times couldn't understand why it should be so, but nevertheless he felt driven to preach that. In the case of Isa alayhi salam in the New Testament, we see that when he entered Jerusalem, the best historical reconstruction about him would say that when he entered Jerusalem, he must have known that the authorities would try to arrest him and put him to death. Death would be inevitable except for the help of God with him. So the fact that he was willing to go into Jerusalem confident of God's help and support with him, facing the consequences no matter what and being willing to preach what he believed, that God gave him a message to preach to others, that is a sign of his sincerity. Now we have two options basically regarding all of these individuals. Either we can say that these have been a uh, dishonest person or madmen, or we can say that they were honest. Now, if they were madmen, then they would not have risen to the importance that they have risen to. History does not celebrate madmen. Otherwise, if history did that, all of humankind would be to blame and we would not be able to trust our own intelligence. Because we'd be saying that human intelligence is such that we recognize and celebrate madmen. That would make us somehow deficient. Second, if we could not say as well that these people were uh, deceiving uh, because, again, it says that uh, the the collective judgment of individuals who recognizes individuals and celebrated them as the best in their communities over time is not a good judgment. And that in a, in a sense would cast uh, aspersions on our own ability to judge. It may mean then that we would celebrate sheikhs and leaders and, and, and holy persons and, and righteous individuals, whereas in fact uh, our own judgment as to who is righteous or not uh, it cannot be dependable because somebody may come after us and say no our judgment was not dependable we picked the wrong guy we picked deceivers and charlatans so that is not a good explanation either the other explanation is that these individuals were honest what they were portraying was a real experience that they had God spoke to them 
and gave them a message to give humankind. So we have this history of revelation coming to prophets. And if the past history is a little bit obscure, the history of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam is very clear. It is available before us. Anyone can study. And although some people have tried to study the life of the Prophet wasallam to try and prove that he's not a messenger of God, in fact, they have not come up with anything that is a reasonable proof. Now, for short of time, I'll refer you to a book that, in fact, deals with some of the uh, studies that have been done on the Prophet Sallallahu in a most excellent manner. It is a gem, a masterpiece uh, now that we have. It's entitled The Quran and the Orientalists uh, by uh, Muhammad Mohar Ali. Uh, this is available on the stalls outside. It's uh, newly published just this year. Uh, you, you should get a hold of this and have it in your library so that if a question comes up, you can always pick it out and read it. You may not be able to read it all in one go, but have it as a, as a reference tool. So if somebody gives you a hard time, you can always say, look, we have a book that answers to those. Basically, this book answers to some of the Orientalists who have tried to look into the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and some have said some strange things. Like Margoliath, for example, uh, said that the Prophet ﷺ was basically deceptive. Uh, Muir before him said that the Prophet ﷺ was suffering from epileptic fits. And he would come out of his fits and he would give these recitations, which he called the Quran as the word of God. As though people come out of epileptic fits and recite beautiful passages like this. And uh, Margolius coming after him said that, okay, he was able to cultivate that. He was able to give that appearance that he's going into this kind of fit in order to convince people that he's getting a revelation from God. But later on, of course, the writers to, uh, came to realize the folly of their own predecessors. And later writers such as William Montgomery Watt would say that the Prophet ﷺ was quite sincere. He really believed that this is a revelation that came to him from the Almighty God. And so we're back to where I started with the argument that the Prophet ﷺ was known as a sincere individual. And therefore, when he said that the revelation came to him from Almighty Allah, we should trust that as a genuine and valid experience. So then altogether, we have four good reasons for thinking that God exists. Now we ask the atheist, what reason do you have for thinking that God does not exist? He says, oh, people just believe because of fear. But you say, well, I didn't believe because of fear. I have good reasons for believing that God exists. So give me a good reason for thinking that God does not exist. He really doesn't have any good reason. Now, uh, fifth, we should add that the belief in God is something that is in it in a person. And in fact, many people have experienced this. If we ask you, how did you know that God exists? Many people cannot really recall how exactly they came to this belief. It seems to be just a natural belief that people have. You observe that everything has a creator and you think that uh, there must be a creator uh, for the heavens and the earth and for everything else. And that is the one God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And you have an experience of God through your worship. You read the Quran and you feel that Allah is speaking to you. You go visit uh, Mecca, you make the Hajj and you feel that you're very close in contact with Allah Azawajal. So you know that Allah is a reality in your life. Now you don't need any further explanation for that. If you speak to most Muslims, most Muslims would not be concerned with all the cosmological and teleological and moral arguments for the existence of God. They just know that God exists. So now, you know that as a basic bit of, of knowledge that you have. And there's a principle in philosophy known as the principle of belief conservation. That says that if you have a belief, then you shouldn't give that up until you see good reasons for giving it up. So now somebody comes and says, no, you shouldn't believe in God. So you should ask them, okay, give me a good reason for not believing in God. Because the principle of belief conservation says, I should hold on to what I believe until I get good reasons for not believing it. So give me a good reason. Now the atheist doesn't really have a good reason. So you should ask, when I already believe that, and when I have those four good reasons for believing that God exists, why should I give that up for no reason at all? <laughs> it is ridiculous that somebody should be asking me to, be give, to give up my belief, which is based on good reason, for no reason at all. So, so much for the atheists. I think the Muslims are, should uh, be very uh, proud and, and confident that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided them. We should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has guided us to a religion which makes sense and uh, which uh, we can hold up to in, even in a modern intellectual age. Now, another group of people that we come into contact with often are people who support uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition. 
And uh, we should uh, be clear to them that in fact if they believed in, in, in the Judeo-Christian scriptures, then they should believe in the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So no matter what people will say about you, they will call you terrorist and they will say that you oppress your women and they will let, let them tell you anything that they want. But say, look, let's come back to the basics. You have a book. You say that this is a book from God. All right, are so you following that book? In the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, in the Jewish scriptures, in chapter 18, in verse number 18, there is a mention of a prophet to come after Musa alayhi salam. This prophet is described as one who will hear the revelations and that God will put the uh, words into his mouth and that is what he will deliver to people telling them about the things to come. This is a clear reference to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam because we can see that this is a description of the manner in which he received the revelation. And again in the Jewish scriptures in the Song of Solomon in chapter 5 in verse number 16 even the name is mentioned because a certain person is being described. His physical features are mentioned. And then it says, he is Muhammad. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse number 16. Now we know the word Muhammad has a meaning. It means uh, one who is praised, the praised one. So if you wanted to translate the name, you can give it a meaning. Just like uh, other names in the Old Testament has a meaning. So they look at the meaning of the word according to the Hebrew language. And then they give it, he is altogether lovely. Instead of keeping the name Muhammad. So one who is reading the English translation has no clue that the word Muhammad is mentioned there. But if you ask any Jewish person to read that verse for you, when he reads it, you will hear the word Muhammad in there because it is there in the Jewish uh, scriptures in the Hebrew language. So even the name is mentioned. In the New Testament, in the Christian scriptures, we find a reference back to that prophecy which was made about the prophet like Musa alayhi salam. Because we see that... Uh, when Isa alayhi salam comes to the scene, there is already an expectation that a prophet is going to come. That prophet is going to come. So in the time of Isa alayhi salam, we also have John the Baptist, who is known to us as Yahya alayhi salam. Now Yahya is baptizing people and he's preaching with authority. So the Jewish leaders who know their scriptures, they come to Yahya and they ask him, according to the Gospel of John in chapter 1, they ask uh, Yahya, are you... The Christ. He says no. They ask him, are you Elijah? He says no. They ask him, are you that prophet? And he says no. So that means the people were expecting three figures. They were expecting Elijah who can come back at any time because they had a, an idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave Elijah the prophet to die but lifted him up. And they thought that any time Elijah will come back into the earth. So they're asking, are you this Elijah? They are expecting that the Messiah, the Christ, will come. Messiah means Christ. Al-Masih means in Greek, the Christ. So they're asking him, are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? He says, no. They ask him, are you that prophet? He says, no. Now why do you ask a thing like that? Are you that prophet? It means there is a specific prophet that they're expecting and they're asking him, are you that prophet? And he says, no. Now, Isa alayhi salam obviously was the Christ. And he came just uh, shortly after uh, Yahya alayhi salam. He was born six months later, according to the New Testament. So, if he is the Christ, well then who is that prophet? Obviously, one who was still to come, judging from the time of Isa alayhi salam. Now, Isa alayhi salam also spoke of that prophet. Because in the Gospel according to John, in chapter 16, in verse number 7, and other related verses in that area, he's talking about a similar individual who is going to come, who is going to hear the words of God, who is going to prophesy and tell about the things which will happen. He's obviously referring to the same individual that was spoken about in the Jewish scriptures, that prophet like Moses. Now many Christians think, well, that Jesus was that prophet, but obviously he was not. Isa alayhi salam left the scene. And according to Acts of the Apostles in chapter 3, we read that Peter, one of the disciples of Jesus, is saying that Isa alayhi salam will remain in heaven until that time of restoration comes. And he's describing that time of restoration as meaning the time when God will send that prophet. So that means Peter, the disciple of Jesus, the chief disciple, is still expecting that that prophet will come and then eventually Isa alayhi salam will come back again. So we see very clearly that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is mentioned in the 
Jewish and Christian scriptures. And if they really truly believe in the scriptures, we Muslims should be asking them to please recognize also the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Because the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 18 verse 19 says that if you do not recognize that Prophet, God will require it of you. In other words, he will bring you to judgment. Now, many of the people we deal with, how much time do we have? 25 minutes. Many of the people we deal with uh, are, of course, our Christian friends. And our Christian friends uh, make up the majority religion in, in the world. And uh, to a certain extent, that is uh, our, due to our failure in conveying the message of Islam. The message of Islam is so clear, and many people who have uh, come to understand Islam, they have come to understand their own belief. Sometimes they were confused about things like the Trinity, and how could Jesus be God, and how could he die for the sins of the world. And when they learn about the Muslim belief in Isa alayhi salam, they come to recognize that that is what they personally have always deep down believed. They might have said some other things, and they might have been confused about what they were saying, but they were saying it because they felt that's what they had to say. But when they search their hearts and find out what do we really believe, they believe that Isa alayhi salam was a man, and the prophet of God, a spokesperson for God, and they cannot see how one man can die for the sins of the world. So we can help them then to understand these points very clearly. First of all, is Isa alayhi salam God or is he man? Now everybody will agree that he was a man. Even Christians who say that he was God will also admit that he was a man. But you see, there are certain things that you cannot have both ways. In Canada they say you cannot have your cake and also eat it. Because if you eat it, you don't have it. You can't have it both ways, see? So if he's a man, he cannot be God. Why? Because if he's a man, he has to think that he's a man. A man who thinks that he's a God is a madman. Uh, so if he's a man, he should be thinking he's a man. But then, if he's thinking he's a man, how could he be God and not know that he's God, you see? So psychologically, he could not be man and God at the same time. To put it in a different way, to be man means to have certain limitations. And to be God means to have none of those limitations. So if one is man, he cannot also be God at the same time. He cannot be limited and unlimited at the same time. As a possible solution to this, Christians think of him as having a kind of dual personality. But nobody has been able to work out what is this dual personality. When you say Jesus, do you mean God or do you mean man? And if we're discussing with somebody, we should ask them, define clearly for me. When you say Jesus, what do you mean? Do you mean man? Do you mean God? Do you mean both? Because obviously he cannot be both at the same time. If you say he switches personality from time to time, you should be sure which personality you're speaking about. So if you're saying Jesus meaning man, of course we shouldn't worship him. And if you're saying Jesus meaning God, when exactly was he God at any part in his life? They might say he performed miracles, but prophets can perform miracles by the help and leave of God. And according to the Bible, Isa alayhi salam was a prophet and he was performing miracles by the help and leave of God. Now it is very clear that Isa alayhi salam did not have the complete knowledge, in which case he cannot be God. According to the Gospel of Mark in chapter 13, verse number 32, it says that Jesus was asked when the day of judgment will occur. And he says, of that day knoweth no man, not even the Son, but the Father. So in other words, the one whom Jesus was calling Father, if these are his words, is the only God, because only he knows when the day of judgment will occur. And even Jesus does not know when the day of judgment will occur, which means that Jesus does not have the complete knowledge, which means he's not the all-knowing God. So, hey, this is so very simple. And this is there in the scriptures for anybody to see. So in short, then, Isa alayhi salam cannot be God. The gospel showed that Isa alayhi salam was praying to God. Now, he wasn't obviously praying to himself. So quote Matthew chapter 26, verse number 39, which shows that Isa alayhi salam fell on his face and he prayed to God and he said, Father, let this cup pass away from me, yet not my will but yours be done. So he's praying, he's making dua. Now, Isa alayhi salam, did he call God Father? We don't have anything in our Islamic sources to say yes or no. Uh, we might take a hint from uh, one of the verses in Surah Al-Ma'idah that the Jews uh, and Christians say, Nahnu awliya Allahi wa abna'u. We are the, the, the friends and the, and the sons, the beloved and the, uh, and the sons of God. Uh, but in, in, if that is the case, Allah says, Kul salima Then for what reason is God uh, punishing you for your sins? So Allah repudiates their claim that they are the, uh, the sons and the ahibba of Allah, right? Nahnu 
Abna'ullahi wa ahibba'u. So Allah is saying, okay, they don't have the right to say that. But whether Isa alayhi salam personally used this term, we cannot say for certain. If he used this term, of course, this would have been nothing strange in the Jewish circles because it was possible for someone to refer to God as Father. We know that from the Old Testament, it was already done. It was possible for somebody to be called Son of God. We know from the Old Testament that was already done. In particular, in the second psalm, in, in verse number 7, Dawood alayhi salam is said to be the begotten Son of God. Because it says, this day, God speaks to Dawood and says, this day, I have begotten you. Dawood. But that doesn't mean literally that Dawood is the son of God. It means that he is a special person. He is chosen by God. He is what we will call in Arabic Mustafa. Selected. So too was Isa a.s. He was a Mustafa. He was a chosen uh, person by God. So there is nothing to show that Isa a.s. was God. Is there anything to show that God is a trinity? No. In fact the word trinity does not occur anywhere in the Bible. Neither does it say in the Bible anywhere that God is three in one. Now there was a verse which was forged into the Bible, and this is well known, and this is what is acknowledged by Christian scholars. I didn't make this up, and I'm not saying this to criticize the Bible. I'm just telling you what Christian scholars have said and what they admit in their commentaries and footnotes. Uh, if we go to the footnote of this Bible, for example, the New American Bible, or if you take the New International Bible, which many of our Christian friends from the evangelical camps are reading, you will see that admits clearly that uh, that verse did not exist in any Greek manuscript prior to the 16th century. That means that for 1600 years, people were reading their Bible, and in the Greek version, the original of that section, it did not have the verse which says that there are three that bear record in heaven. The verse that says that there are three that bear record in heaven is 1 John chapter 5, verse number 16. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse number 16. Now that was in the Bible and read for 300 years in the King James Version of the Bible. And then nowadays many modern translations have been made. And in all of these modern translations that verse is removed because Christian scholars have seen that the ancient manuscripts did not contain that verse. Which means that it is a later addition. In other words, it is a forgery that somebody had placed into the Bible to have at least one verse that tells you that there are three in heaven and these three are one. But now that that verse has been taken out, there is no verse left that says that there are three in heaven that are one. And throughout the Bible, there is a mention of only one God. Uh, for example, in Deuteronomy in chapter 6, verse number 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And similarly, in the Gospel according to Mark, it says that Isa a.s. was asked, What is the greatest of all of the commandments? And he said the same thing, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So Isa a.s. is repeating the same teaching, and that's the gospel according to Mark in chapter 12, verse number 29. Now I know you're not going to remember all of this, but if you're making notes, please make, write down these verse numbers. If not, then please make sure you get a copy of the tape uh, later on, because this is information that is very valuable. You should be using it. Now, another aspect is to describe uh, the idea that uh, somebody died for your sins. What time is it? The idea that somebody died for your sins, is that a logical and reasonable idea? Now you don't need any scripture reference for that, but if you need one, go to the book of Ezekiel in chapter 18, verse number 1. The soul that sins, that's the one that shall die. But even if you don't remember that, just go with the logic of it. Why would Allah cru uh, crucify an innocent person in order that the guilty one should go free? Does that make any sense? Would any judge do that? Uh, no, obviously not. You cannot uh, penalize the innocent person in order for the guilty ones to go free. The only time when an innocent person might do something like that is when the innocent person pays a fine, for example. And that is because the judge does not have the authority to cancel the ticket. But if the judge had the authority to cancel, he can reduce the fine, he can dismiss the charge, he can do any of that. But if he wants to keep his job, he has to show that he is at least giving some penalties. And in that case, if he says you have to give a 50 pound fine, and if your brother pays it for you, that's okay. Because the judge does not have the authority to cancel it altogether. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all the authority. He does not have to punish an individual if he doesn't want to. And if he decides to forgive somebody, nobody is going to question him. Oh uh, God, but why did you forgive that person? 
The Quran says, La yus'alu amma yafal wa hum yus'alun. Allah is not to be questioned about what he does, but they are to be questioned. So if Allah forgives a person that's within his prerogative, he can do that. On the other hand, according to what our Christian friends tell us, God still had to forgive people, even after taking the, the price from his beloved son. So that doesn't seem to make any sense. Because if the son paid the price, that means they all go free. If all of you go to the local store and you buy up a lot of things on credit, and uh, if Brother Imtiaz comes and pays, because uh, he's a rich brother, if he comes and pays all your bills, then that means you all go free. The shopkeeper can no longer come back to you and say, but wait a minute, Ahmed, you didn't pay your bill. Because if he's an honest shopkeeper, he couldn't come back to you with that. Now that doesn't make any difference whether you know Imtiaz, whether you even like the guy. Your bills are settled whether you know him or like him or not. So if Isa a.s. really paid the sins for all of the people, he paid the penalty for everyone, then everyone should automatically go free. And obviously nobody would claim that. Therefore they should not claim that he died for the sins of everyone. Now a complicated problem I have found uh, for our Christian friends to deal with is to ask them who exactly died on the cross then. You see, they say that uh, Jesus died on the cross. And we ask, why Jesus? Why not somebody else? Can I die for the sins of the world? They say, no, because you're a sinner yourself. Only Jesus can die for the sins of the world. So we say, okay, so all right, so he's sinless, so he dies for the sins of the world. But he's still one man. How could one man pay for everybody? It said that his blood, because he's God, his sacrifice is infinite. And so that is good for all of the people. You say, okay, so the infinite sacrifice, God himself died on the cross. So God died. They say no. <laughs> so then you should stop saying that God died for your sins. Because when it comes to the cross, they say no, only the man part of him died. But God didn't die. So if God didn't die, why did you say in the first place that God will die for your sins? A second complicated problem for them is sometimes you have to make things dramatic so that they understand very easily. You imagine that God, uh, if, if, or, or to take this situation of a judge. You know what happened with, uh, according to the Gospels. According to the Gospels, Isa a.s. was in the garden and he was praying uh, to God uh, to save him from the cross. And he says, not my will but yours be done. So finally, of course, obviously it was the will of God according to the Christian scriptures for him finally to be crucified. So now, okay, so he's crucified. But look at the logic of this. Suppose a judge, he has a bunch of criminals before him, right? And he says to them, criminals, I want you to go free because I love you. <laughs> and then, but he says, but somebody's got to pay the price here. Guards, bring my son. And then the guards come in with the son and the son is pleading and bending down and begging and saying, Father, please, you know, let this... Uh, let there be some other way. Dad, you're the greatest guy in the world. Can't you think of some other way? Couldn't it be somewhere else? Let me go. And the father says, No, son, you've got to die. <laughs> Criminals, I love you. <laughs> now, you can see that obviously, obviously this makes no sense. And I mention it to you, not to entertain you brothers, but to show you the, the gravity of responsibility that you have. There are people who would like to be freed from this uh, sort of understanding, but they do not have something better that they have been exposed to. And you average Muslim, Muhammad, Fatima, all of you, can go out there and just explain these simple logical points to people, and they will understand it. Just show them that Islam is the completion and the fruition of all of the expectations and hopes. Uh, that teaching which they've been trying to follow has now been shown more clearly in, in Islam, in the revelation from Allah Azza wa Jal, and that they need to follow that. So I know I've spoken to you at length. I want to wrap up very quickly so I can take some of your questions, and then we have some further business to look into. Shukran. Assalamu alaikum. There should be some paper being passed around to the brothers and sisters. So if you could uh, write down your questions clearly. Make sure the questions are related to the topic and we'll try and take as many questions as possible. Um, we should also have a brother roaming with the mic, so if there's any questions from the floor, please raise your hands and we'll take your questions. I'd like to remind the brothers to make sure your questions are related to the topic and your questions should not extend more than uh, one minute.
Okay, first question goes to the brother in the middle, just in front of you. Assalamu alaikum. Can you stand up, please? Assalamu okay. alaikum. Uh, the question I wanted to ask was uh, how do you tackle these two areas? One is the, One is the? humanist argument, yes. and the second argument is the born again Christian argument that uses the first few pages of John Gospel and uses that to base their argument that the existence of God, that Jesus being God as well. Yes. Okay, first, uh, the humanist argument. I think we basically covered that when we deal with, dealt with the atheism, because once you prove that God exists, uh, and that God has sent revelations to the, to the world, then that kills the humanist position, because the humanist position basically says either that there is no God, or even if God does exist, he doesn't matter because he has no concern with the world, and we just go ahead and live life as we please. But once we show that God does exist, and two, that God did send revelation, then the humanist is without a position. Now, how do we deal with the Christian who uses the first uh, passage of John's Gospel to prove that Jesus is divine? Well, very simply, uh, we should say that without getting into the grammatical, grammatical explanation of that verse, just put in your mind that there are four Gospels, and John is the last of the four Gospels to be written. They're written over a long period of time. So John's Gospel is written around the year 100, and Isa alayhi salam has left the scene around the year 30. So John's Gospel is written how many years after Isa alayhi salam left? 70 years. The first of the four Gospels to be written was Mark, written about 70 uh, of the first century, which means about 30 years after Isa alayhi salam. 30 plus 40 is 70. And Matthew and, and Luke in between. So if you have Mark written, you have Matthew and Luke written, and then finally John written, you would expect that the important teaching should be in all of them, even if all the details vary, true? Okay, now if Jesus is God, that's an important teaching, yes or no? If, if Jesus is God, is, that, is it important to tell the world? Yes. So all of the Gospels would say it, true? Now, Ma Mark doesn't say it, Matthew and Luke doesn't say it, only John seems to say it. I'm only saying seems because I didn't go into the grammatical explanation yet. But for the average person in this room, just realize you have four Gospels. Even if you say the fourth one says it, why doesn't the first and second and third? Because that is a later idea that comes to be imposed in the writing of the fourth Gospel. Once you know this, you will settle many arguments. Whenever they come pull you something from John's Gospel, first of all, you may not know where it comes from. Where it, where it comes from ask them, which Gospel is that from? If they say, John, red flag, that's the fourth Gospel. Why is it not in the first gospel? It should be there. For, so, the, the John's gospel says in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, uh, in, in many of the translations. So say, okay, that's beautiful, but why is it not in Mark's gospel? Why is it not in Matthew and in Luke? Only in John, the last to be written? That seems to be a later idea, and indeed it is a later idea, and that's not the original and true Jesus. Okay, we'll take a question from the right side. Um, at the front here. No, wait for the microphone. <laughs> uh, one of the new arguments I've heard about uh, uh, how Muslims, hello, sorry, when Muslims they they uh, pr uh, preach to the Christians or advise the Christians that. Uh, we are not the enemy as much as they like to think. We do not hate Jesus. We love Jesus. He is a prophet of ours, etc. And how the Prophet ﷺ explained we are closer to them than the Jews and vice versa, etc. Uh, how they, in fact, are opposition. How the Jews insult Jesus, etc. A new argument has arisen where they actually come up with some proofs to show the Jesus we believe in is different from the Jesus the Christians believe in. Uh, I don't remember all of the proofs they brought forward. Maybe you can touch on that. Inshallah. Yes, well, of course, they will try to say, look, uh, we Christians believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You guys deny that. We believe that Jesus died for our sins. You guys deny that. So you don't believe in the same Jesus. 
We should explain that indeed we believe in the same Jesus, but we have two different conceptions of him. If we are thinking about a certain person and one says he's guilty and the other one says he's innocent, we're talking about the same person, but we have two different conceptions of him. Yes, so it's the same person. Now we should see, well, which conception of Jesus is the correct one? Now, uh, Paul in his writing has said that Jesus died in a cursed death. Now this is an important claim and you should understand the gravity of that. So Paul starts by condemning Jesus, saying that Jesus died the death of an accursed person. And then they try to rescue him or to prove that he is innocent by proving that he resurrected from the dead. And to this day, nobody can prove that Jesus actually resurrected from the dead. So if we hear it from their own mouths, first of all, they have condemned their man as a guilty person, die, having died as a criminal under the curse of God. And then they try to say, but you know, he's, no, he's not really under the curse of God because look, he resurrected from the dead. And we say, okay, well, prove to me that Jesus resurrected from the dead. And he has no proof. In the New Testament, they say that Jesus reappeared to his disciples. But look carefully at those accounts which say that Jesus appeared to his disciples. You will find often that when they see him, they couldn't recognize him from his face and even from his voice. All they can see is that he has some marks of crucifixion. Which means obviously that what they were seeing is somebody who obviously was crucified, but somebody who doesn't look or sound like Jesus. So what do you have there? A different crucified man? So look at the, look at the Gospels very carefully. In Matthew's Gospel, it says that Jesus uh, uh, gave an instruction to his disciples that they are to come meet him on a certain mountain. Matthew chapter 28 verse number 17 says that when they went there and met him uh, on the mountain, they saw him and they worshipped but they doubted. Now what do you mean that they doubted? One translation of the Bible says they were not sure that this really was Jesus. So that means they saw, and that's the end of the story. They see Jesus this one time and they doubt that this is, the, this is truly Jesus. And now they can say they saw the resurrected Jesus. In the Gospel according to Luke, it says that when Jesus came into the room, they, they, they were afraid. And they thought that they were seeing a ghost. And then Jesus says, well, you know, touch me and see that the ghost does not have flesh and bone as I do. But why should he have to say that? You know, if we know the brother, we love the brother. Like, the brother comes in here. We knew he was dead before, and he comes in here. We're not going to be afraid of him. We're going to love him and go and meet him and be delighted that he's back. Whether spirit or not, doesn't matter. Just to see him is enough. Why, why, why doesn't he say, look at me, I am the person you already know. Why does he have to show flesh and bone and hand and feet and nail wound and, and uh, dental record and shoe size and all of that? Uh, just from his face, they can recognize him. In the Gospel according to John, it says that Mary of Magdalene, one of his uh, close followers, a woman, was there visiting the garden, trying to see the tomb and didn't find Jesus. And she was weeping and uh, she was worried about what happened to his body. And Jesus came and uh, spoke to her and she looked at him and she thought that uh, he was the gardener. Now, why would he think that he's the gardener if he has the face and the voice of Jesus when she, he already spoke to him, uh, spoke to her? And she turned back and she wept some more. And then when he said to her, Mary, that's when she clued in that, oh, this is Jesus. And she said, uh, Rabboni, which means my teacher. So why did she not recognize him from his voice and from his facial features? Why only when he said Mary, perhaps in some special way, that that touched a chord in her and then she realizes this was Jesus. That means again, she was seeing somebody who looked like a gardener, but didn't look like Jesus, and she said, we saw Jesus. So whom did they actually see? So in short then, and I have to end it here, Paul said that Jesus died in a cursed death by dying on the cross. But he's not accursed because God raised him from the dead and we know that. So he said, okay, show me that God raised him from the dead. And they showed us these records. And these records show that the people who said that they saw him couldn't recognize him from his face or, the vo or his voice. What did they see? Another person who was crucified? They do not really have that proof. And therefore, they cannot offer that. So in short, we should say we believe in the true Jesus. And we defend him and support him from the beginning to end. We never say he died in a cursed death. We believe that he was always under the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was always with the help and support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah aided him with the Holy Spirit. Allah rescued him and raised him to himself. And we believe he will come again. He is the true prophet and messiah. He is born of a virgin. He performed many miraculous deeds. And we believe in everything that he taught. And by following the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we're also following Isa alayhi salam and all of the prophets. 
uh, chap uh, in, in his letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verse number 13. 